Professor Randall received both her bachelor's and doctorate degrees from Harvard University. She served on the faculty at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Princeton University before returning to Harvard in 2001. Professor Randall is a theoretical physicist whose research lies at the intersection between particle physics and cosmology, which is the study of the origins and early evolution of the universe. In the physics community, she's famous for, among other things, her work in formulating models of space that invoke extra dimensions to solve the question of why gravity is so weak compared to the other four fundamental forces. She also studies the origin of ordinary matter, that's the stuff that you and I are made out of, and, uh, known as baryons. She studies cosmological inflation, which is the theory that the universe expanded very rapidly when it was less than a second old. And she studies dark matter, which is not the stuff you and I are made out of. Uh, we don't know what it is, but it pervades the universe and has a profound effect on its evolution. Professor Randall has won too many award, awards to mention them all here. Uh, when she was 18 years old, she won first place in the Westinghouse Science Talent Search. Uh, she's, <laughs> so she started on her awards young, and the list is now long. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, a little over a decade ago, she delivered the prestigious George Gamow Memorial Lecture here at CU Boulder, and I had the pleasure of accompanying her skiing up at Eldora. Um, she was named among the 100 most influential people by Time Magazine in 2006. She's the author of numerous scientific papers as well as four books for the popular press, two of which were named among the 100 notable books of the year by the New York Times. Today, she is speaking about her latest book on dark matter and dinosaurs, the astounding interconnectedness of the universe. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lisa Randall. So uh, good afternoon. Um, Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here um, at this place, that, um, this event that combines together two of things that I think are quite wonderful, which is um, the Jaipur Literary Festival and Boulder. Um, I really love it here. <laughs> it doesn't get much better than that. Um, and also, I know I'm speaking to a smart audience because you were resourceful enough to get beyond the program, so thank you all for being here. <laughs> so I expect you to be able to understand everything. This is great. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be telling you um, some of the stuff that's in my latest book, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm trying to do, but I'll give you a little bit of a story as we go along. Um, so first let me just say, um, because I'm going to focus a little bit on, very sp on some specific things that are, in the, that are in this book, but I just want to say first why I wrote the book, which are kind of two reasons. Um, one is that, I, I, as um, Neil said, I, I've written a, a several books. And um, the others were more on, on particle physics, which is elementary particles in the interior of matter. And it's very, very hard to try to really um, bring to life some of the things that are going on there. I've worked very hard, um, but it's not stuff that you see and encounter in your daily life. It is responsible for everything you see in your daily life, um, but it's not the interactions that you're seeing because we're not at the scale of elementary particles. On the, on the other hand, when you talk about um, cosmology and astrophysics, um, although we're not really seeing those things, they seem to be, um, they're obeying classical physical laws in ways that make it somewhat easier to understand. So it was really nice for me to be doing this research on dark matter that had very immediate connections to things that we see in, in the universe today. Of course, that's true of all of particle physics, but it was really fun to try to explore some of these connections. The other reason I wrote it is that, you know, a lot of books are written about one particular topic, focusing very narrowly on one particular thing. And I really wanted something that told the story of the evolution of the universe um, from the beginning and, and brought us all the way up to today. To sort of, and in particular, I had in the back of my mind the rapid rate at which we're changing things on the surface of the Earth. So I wanted people to have in mind just how much work it took to get us here, how, how many interesting and fascinating processes. So it really has, in the beginning, it's talking about cosmology, it's talking about, the, um, it's talking about galaxies, our galaxy, the Milky Way, the solar system, um, and Earth, Earth, and life on Earth. So it really has a lot of different elements. 
So I'm going to focus on the, the elements that actually were responsible for the title of the book, um, which is about a speculative theory that we have that could have dramatic consequence, could have had dramatic consequences for Earth. So, um, and I'll be, try to be very careful to distinguish between stuff that we pretty much have established and where it's speculation and things that we want to actually investigate further. So first of all, let's just uh, start with what's sometimes called the cosmic pie, um, which tells you about how much of the energy of the universe is in various, various elements. Um, so the part that's labeled atoms, otherwise known as baryons, as Neil said, is sort of, it's about 5% of the universe. That's the stuff that's made up of the things that you and I are made of, that this podium is made of, the stuff that we know, the stuff the galaxy is made, um, that we can see is made of. Um, it's matter that we think of as ordinary matter. It's the stuff we're familiar with. It's the stuff that's built up of atoms, okay? It turns out that that is only about 5% of the energy of the universe. And there is about five times that amount of energy contained in something called dark matter. Now, first of all, dark matter is actually not dark because dark is stuff that absorbs light. Dark matter is stuff that really doesn't interact with light as all, at all, as far as we can see. It might have a tiny interaction and people are still looking for that, but as far as we can tell, it's not interacting at all. So it might have been known as transparent matter um, because light basically just passes through. Um, so the rest of it is something called dark energy, which is something I'm not gonna talk about here um, for, for several reasons, but, um, but let me just say that dark energy is basically energy that just permeates the universe. It's not carried by matter. Um, so it's not stuff that clumps together into galaxies. As far as we know, it's uniform. There's stuff that's uniformly distributed throughout the universe and has some constant value over time. And that's what we mean by dark energy. And the, and the, the evidence for that was, the first evidence for that was the acceleration um, of the expansion of the universe as seen in supernova. Um, but there's been other evidence since. Um, now, one thing that I would you like you to notice about this pie, because I do find it really intriguing, um, as someone who actually, you know, sometimes likes pie, is that if you ate any of those slices of pie, you would have a substantial amount. It's not like one of those slices is so tiny you don't see it. In fact, if it was, we probably wouldn't be there, um, which, and it isn't. So these are all elements of the universe that are fairly comparable. So in some ways, 5% of the energy of the universe sounds like not very much, but on the other hand, you know, it's a reasonable slice. You know, it's something that, you know, if you, if you were given, you know, a 20th of a piece of pie, you know, you'd probably feel reasonably healthy, but, you know, you're not that healthy. So um, it's, it's a substantial amount. And I think that's actually, to me, the more striking thing. Most people, you know, get very upset and say, how can it be that most of the universe is dark? But from my perspective, it's actually amazing that the stuff that we're made of, I mean, we're just, you know, we don't know how much of the universe we're, we really represent. And that the fact that there's 5% of the energy contained in the stuff that we're made of, I think is actually fairly striking. Okay. So um, what is dark matter? Well, it's matter. And by that, I mean, it's, it's going to sound tautological, but it's stuff that interacts with gravity like matter. That is to say, it's stuff that clumps. Um, it has a non-uniform density distribution because of that. It's stuff that's in our galaxy. Um, but what makes it different is that, as far as we know, it's not interacting via other forces with, um, with the matter we know. In particular, it doesn't seem to have electromagnetic interactions, um, but it also doesn't have any of the other interactions of the standard model, the weak or strong forces. Um, it might be that it does, again, at a very small level, but it's so small that we haven't seen it yet, and it's getting tested more and more precisely over time. Um, but as I said just now, I don't find it super surprising that it exists. Okay. And just to put it in perspective, you might say, where is it? You, know, you might not worry about it because it's somewhere out there, but if it, if it is you know, what one of the standard models would say, or theories would say it is, you have billions of dark matter particles passing through you every second. Now, that, you might say, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be the case, but if it's not interacting with you, you wouldn't know about it. Right? And so, basically, it's stuff that's passing through that you re it's really not interacting, so you don't know about it. So the answer to the question is, where is dark matter, is in part that it's right here. Um, but as we'll see, it's also something that, as far as we know, um, surrounds us in an approximately spherical um, halo, what we call halo in the galaxy. And even though we don't see these, this dark matter, and even though it has so little interaction, it's, we don't feel it or sense it in any way. 
There's a lot of it, right? Again, there's five times the energy in dark matter as ordinary matter. And so it probably was responsible for giving shape to our universe in the lifetime of our universe. It probably was what started the universe clumping and forming in the way it did. And in fact, without dark matter, we probably wouldn't be here today. So why do we think there is dark matter? How do we see? Um, this is actually the wrong version of the, of the talk, but that's okay. <laughs> but this is, this is just to say, let me go back. This is just to say we know about it in a lot of different ways. Um, so it's not just, so a lot of the time you hear, you know, we have an alternative to dark matter, Einstein's equations are wrong. I mean, first of all, you know, changing Einstein's equations is far more radical than thinking that there's dark matter. I mean, it's just hubris that makes us think that we're, we're made up of is the entire universe. There's no reason for that to be the case. I mean, who's to say there isn't other for, another form of matter that has no other interactions with us? And you say, well, um, if there were, wouldn't we know about it? And the answer is clearly no, because it's not interacting with us. <laughs> um, so, so there's no reason for us to think it's not there. But the other thing is that usually when there's alternative theories, they address one problem at most. So there's a whole list of stuff here. I don't have time to go into the details of all of them, but I do want to mention, for example, galactic rotation curves. So that's, for example, was first seen in our galaxy. Vera Rubin was responsible, along with others, for, for measuring what are called rotation curves in our galaxies. So a galaxy has many stars. Stars rotate in our galaxy. And it turns out they rotate so quickly that if all there was was the visible matter, it wouldn't be enough gravitational pull to keep them in the galaxy. They would be just be flying out. Now, of course, that's sort of reversing logic. What really happens is that they are responding to the gravitational pull of all the matter that's there. And there's actually, and it turns out there is dark matter there that's also helping those rotation curves. Um, so what are some of these others? Well, there's um, galaxy clusters with variable velocities. So it's, it's similar in spirit. Um, galaxy clusters are groups of galaxies, the same way galaxies are groups of stars. You can measure the velocities of those galaxies, and again, those velocities are bigger than what you would expect because of the dark matter that's presumably contained in them. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, gravitational lensing, the Bulla cluster, and there's a few others, but I think with, you know, a couple of the most striking are um, the existence of galaxies in the lifetime of our universe, because without dark matter, that wouldn't have happened. Um, there wouldn't have been enough time for structure to grow because structure can't grow until basically the matter density dominates over the radiation density, because radiation doesn't clump. So basically, without having the additional dark matter in our, the lifetime of the universe, we wouldn't have had time to form stuff. And also, because it doesn't interact with light, you can form structure on smaller scales. Um, without dark matter, we wouldn't have been able to form structure on the scale of a galaxy. And, um, Another thing I will mention and give a shout out to Niels who works on this is the cosmic microwave background, which is, I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but it is important to know that it is a very detailed measurement of radiation on the sky. And it really imprints, it's such a detailed measurement that it can imprint um, really fundamental quantities about the universe. It was really a game changer in terms of doing cosmology because you can basically look back to before structure formed when radiation sort of decoupled in the sky. And so by looking at that, you can actually also learn about the amount of dark matter. And it's fascinating, and all of these measurements are consistent. I'll just give you a flavor of a couple of, um, of these that I mentioned, too. Um, one of the things that I think is also very cool is something called gravitational lensing. And one of the reasons it's cool is because it's a way of sort of tracing where the dark matter is, in a sense. Now, dark matter itself doesn't emit light, um, and apparently neither does this um, thing. Um, so I will just have to. <laughs> so uh, oh, wait. oh wait, it does. It does. There we go. There we go. Uh, I thought it did. Is it working? Where is it? Seems to go away. Anyway, well, you'll have to bear with me and just have to look. Okay. So there's even though the dark matter itself. So here, here the dark matter is contained in that um, galaxy that I'm pointing to, but there's no light on it because um, it's dark matter. Um, but, there, but even though it's not emitting light, um, the thing called li very cleverly labeled object is emitting light. Um, so you might imagine that there's some galaxy or galaxy cluster behind it or something that's emitting light. Um, so what happens is when that light goes around um, the whatever contains the dark matter, it's bent because of the gravitational pull. And how much it's bent depends on how much matter there is of any sort 
It could be visible matter, it could be dark matter. So what happens, so you might have something that you, you don't even see or something that emits very little light, but what happens with gravitational lensing is you can imagine um, if there's strong lensing, things, you get multiple images of the same thing because how that light bends depends on how it went around the object. Um, in this picture, if, where it says drew path into deflected light, if it went above it, you see the deflected light goes down, and if it went below, then the deflected light goes up. So when you are looking, so we're on Earth uh, looking at it, and you project back because you think light went in straight lines. And so you don't, you don't project back bent light, you project back straight light. And so it looks like there are multiple images of the same object. And um, this is a sort of crude, very um, simplistic, cartoonish way of saying it, but by looking at lensing of various sorts, you can sort of trace um, where dark matter is in the sky. Um, but and in response to people who think um, it's just an alteration of the theory of gravity, things like the bullet cluster are really interesting because the bullet cluster is basically formed from the merging of um, cluster, clusters of galaxies. So again, clusters of galaxies contain many galaxies, um, but they contain gas as well and dark matter, okay? So what happens when they merge is that gas, because it interacts, kind of gets stuck in the middle, right? It experiences essentially friction of some sort. Whereas dark matter, to the extent that it's not interacting, goes right through. So with lensing, you can actually see the separation of the dark matter, which is there in blue, from the gas, which is there in pink, okay? So this is really strong evidence. It's really doing exactly what you would expect for something that is so-called dark matter. That is to say, um, it's, it's going through, it's not being slowed down, and it acts just like matter. And it's very hard to think of how to modify the theory of gravity to do something like that. And actually, many of those other things on the list are very hard to accommodate through a modified theory of gravity. Okay. So from my perspective, dark matter is not speculation. Um, there's really a lot of evidence for it. It's consistent. Um, we don't see it literally with our eyes, but we see all this, these gravitational influences, which is exactly what you would expect from dark matter, and they give a consistent um, scenario for how much dark matter there is in the universe, which is where those numbers I gave you. Okay. And as I said, you know, dark matter is sort of the unsung hero in my book. I'm not very good at saying them out loud, but I have like lots of kind of silly analogies or not so silly. Um, but you know, it's like basically we have a lot of hubris. We focus on the light matter, which is what stuff that interacts. But actually dark matter is responsible for all that infrastructure that underlies it. Like I said, without dark matter, we wouldn't have galaxies. So you might think of it as analogous to you know, the, the, all the workers who actually built a building. I mean, we focus on the architect and the owners of the building, but there's a lot of work that went into it. So dark matter is doing a lot of work that um, actually creates the universe that we do literally see. Okay. But there are a lot of questions we still don't know the answer to. That's a very nice story that fits together very well, but at some level, we don't know exactly what those pieces are that I told you about. That is to say, um, there are some big questions for cosmology. Um, we don't know why dark energy has the amount that it does. Um, we don't know what dark matter is in the sense of we don't know at a fundamental level what it is, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And even in the case of atoms, um, we sort of understand atoms, but there's actually still an existing question of why there's more matter than antimatter. Had there been equal amounts of matter and antimatter like you'd expect, we wouldn't even have that 5% of matter sitting there. We basically would have no matter left. So the fact that we're here today is also um, attributable to something that we don't yet know the answer to, what created the matter, antimatter asymmetry. So all of these are big cosmological questions that we would like to understand the answers to. But I'm gonna focus on dark matter, and since I don't have the slide here, I just wanna say, when I say what is dark matter, what do I mean by that? Um, so first of all, we wanna know, you know, is it a particle? Like the stuff that we know of is made up of elementary particles. In fact, that's where I started my research doing elementary particle physics. So sort of the underlying particles that underlie all the matter that we can, can see. So, you know, we have reason to think that dark matter is also made up of particles. Um, and in fact, people look for dark matter that's more, you know, big compact objects. And, and there's a lot of um, constraints on that scenario. But even if it is particles, um, we still don't really know what that means, what it is because we want to know what those particles are. Well, what do we mean by what those particles are? Well, it, really, it's a question of defining them by their properties. 
So we'd like to know, is dark matter, is there, what is the mass of the dark matter particle? Um, does it have interactions? Does it interact with our matter? Does it interact with itself, even if it doesn't interact with our matter? Um, is it even one single particle? Okay. So we don't know the answers to any of those questions. So as a theoretical physicist, one of the things we do is try to figure out ways to address those questions. And one of the ways we do that is by speculating about models. So we say, suppose dark matter was this, suppose it had this mass, suppose it had these interactions, what would be the effects? And that's what gave rise to the research that I'm talking about today. Okay. So um, back to the question of where dark matter is. Um, I already said this, but I just want to remind you that so in, in galaxies, dark matter is more or less in spherical halos around it. Um, that, that gives rise to the right structure of the stuff that we do see. Um, but actually, the matter that we see, um, remember I said it's only five, you know, a fifth of the amount, or a sixth of the amount of total matter. Um, yet, it has big effects here. Well, one of the reasons that's true is because ordinary matter is actually um, confined to a more narrow disk. It's not diffusely distributed throughout the spherical halo. It's more compact. And the reason for that is exactly because it does have these interactions. Um, it interacts with light. It actually radiates. So ordinary matter can radiate. And because of that, it can cool down. And when it cools down, it collapses into this disk of the Milky Way. Um, you might ask, why is it collapsing into a disk and not just a ball? And that's because there's uh, angular momentum conservation. So it can't just collapse. Um, so that's what gives rise to the Milky Way that actually you are fortunate enough. I know, you, I know you're complaining about the dry weather, but you're fortunate enough to live in a place where you can actually see the Milky Way, which is very beautiful. Um, OK. So as I said, this is what I said before. We still don't know what this dark matter is. What are its properties? And the reason we have some hope of, of learning about its properties is, well, clearly, if there's some interaction with our matter, there are, well, not so clearly, but if there is some interaction with our matter, uh, very clever people can think of ways to design experiments to test those. But even if it's interacting with itself, it could have implications for how that dark matter is distributed, which would ultimately affect the gravitational potential that visible matter does see. And that's, again, kind of the focus of the research that I was doing. Okay. So, and this is what I said earlier, we do model building. Um, not because we necessarily think all of our models are correct. In fact, I mean, this is something that I think a lot of people find really surprising, is that at the same time, I can work on mutually exclusive models. Because they are models. We don't know which is right. And the way to find out if they're right, and it's also, it's not, you know, people always have this image of sort of telescope time that you have to look, you know, say in advance what you're looking for and just look at that. But the great beauty of things like uh, the kind of experiments that go on at the Large Hadron Collider or even looking at structure is that you can take the same data and test many different models because they might have very different implications for what you can see. And so when we make models, we have you know, two things in mind, at least. Um, one is to you know, put together the ingredients we have and try to explain uh, properties that seem inconsistent or aren't yet explained. But we also have in mind the fact that we want to guide experiments in the future or observations in the future. Um, for, as most of you know, if you don't know what you're looking for, you often miss it. So it really helps to have some guiding principles that tell you what to look for, not to the extent that you think it's there when it's not, but just so you have very rigorous ways to be able to establish the difference between the stuff you're looking for and the stuff that you're not looking for. Um, I just wanted to mention this because some of you probably do know about this. I'm not, it's not the focus of my work, but a lot of people um, who know about dark matter have heard of WIMPs. Um, which I have to say, um, the particle physics community was a bit too overly sanguine about thinking they knew what dark matter is. They said, we, um, no, I think WIMPs is a fascinating possibility. I will tell you what it is in a minute. Um, and, but one of its major advantages is that it's more readily testable. So WIMPs stands for weakly interacting massive particles. Um, it's actually not the same as the weak interaction of the standard model, but it is something that is interacting a lot less strongly than ordinary matter. Okay. Now, the reason it was considered a viable uh, dark matter candidate is because this what could be a remarkable coincidence or could be based in real physics, um, which is that if dark matter has about the same mass as the Higgs boson that was discovered in 2012, um, 
and you just assume, let it just follow its thermal evolution. You let it interact according to the, the interactions you would have for a particle of that mass. You find that the amount of stuff you have left over at the end of the day, that is to say today, is just about the right amount of energy to be dark matter. Of course, what exactly you get depends on the precise model. But a lot of people have reason, and we have reasons to believe that the Higgs particle is not everything that's there, that there's other stuff that's sitting there at around the same energy. Now, admittedly, we haven't seen that, and so people are getting more worried about whether or not even that part's true. But if that is true and there is a stable particle in that sector, it would be a viable dark matter candidate. And as I said, the reason people like it is, first of all, it's connected more directly to standard model stuff. It explains why the energy is what it is, um, why the energy is so similar to ours because of this coincidence. Um, but also it has the major advantage that if it is an extension of the standard model of particle physics, it probably does share interactions at some small level with standard model stuff, which means you can look for it. So, and one of the reasons I want to mention this is because a lot of people cast down on dark matter because they say we haven't seen dark matter. But really when people talk about dark matter searches, what they're generally really talking about are searches for WIMPs. And that's because WIMPs are things that do have this interaction with our, our matter. And the way you do it is, um, this is um, from my second book, um, Knocking on Heaven's Door, it was a picture that was done for me. Um, and there are three ways um, people try to look for this dark matter. Um, and really the most robust and the one that was probably the oldest and been around for a while is, is known as direct detection. And there, in that case, you have detectors which are deep underground. They're in uh, tunnels or mines. The reason they're d deep underground is to shield you from cosmic rays. Um, it turns out um, it's not just enough to see the dark matter. You have to see the dark matter and be convinced it's not anything that you would have had otherwise. And there's lots of, st there's lots of stuff that radiates. If you have your finger touch the detector, that would way overwhelm any dark matter signal. So these guys have to be super careful and have to find ways to reject stuff that actually isn't actually the signal they're looking for. But having said that, um, the idea is if you have some very, very weak interaction of dark matter, um, even though it's weak interacting with any individual particle, if you have enough particles, it can act, you have a chance of seeing it. It's like buying lots of lottery tickets. Any one lottery ticket you might not win, but if you buy enough of them, you have a chance. Um, still pretty small, but. <laughs> <laughs> Same is true for dark matter detection. Um, but people have improved this over the years, and you know, within the next 10 years, we're probably going to cover what is the motivated WIMP parameter space. Um, so one of the questions you have is, you know, if you don't find that, what is it? And so I want to argue that that's just one possibility for dark matter, and it's worth thinking about if there's other ways we might know about what dark matter is. Um, also in this our figure are two different ways we could think about looking for dark matter, who really does have the same mass as the Higgs boson, or about that mass. You have a chance of finding something evidence for it at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and the other one is if you have dark matter that does interact with itself, but also with ordinary matter, you have the chance that dark matter can annihilate, that is to say, in some sense, dark matter and anti-dark matter could turn into ordinary matter and ordinary antimatter, the antimatter particles of ordinary matter. So, and that's something you could detect because it would interact with our detectors. I mean, dark matter is interacting very little, but if it turned into electron, positron, that would be charged and it would be something you could detect. So those are the ways people look, say they're looking for dark matter, but really what they're looking for is WIMPs. And they haven't seen anything. Okay. So, so far I've told you stuff that's all true. Okay. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you about my research, which is true in a sense, but it's speculative. I don't know if it's out there. Just like we don't know if WIMPs are right, uh, the model I'm going to present to you, I don't know if it's right. But what I will tell you about is um, why we think it's interesting and why we think, and what the consequences might be and how we might look for it. Okay? So, um, so basically, the in insight is, first of all, um, that there could be a distinct type of dark matter, that dark matter isn't just a single particle. There's the dark matter that forms the halo, but there can be another um, part of dark matter. Um, and I should say this is work that I did with um, uh, Gigi Fan, Ami Katz, and Matt Reese, um, and, uh, the original model. And so there could be a distinct type of dark matter. And 
it could, what I'm going to argue is that it could give distinctive shape to galaxies that could be detectable. And what gave rise to the title, and this is even more speculative, is that it could conceivably affect the motion of the solar system depending on exactly what that shape is and could conceivably trigger comet strikes. Um, and, or I should have said, well, comet strikes. And um, one of which might have caused the last major mass extinction. So I'll tell you about this now. Okay. Okay. So again, I mean, I think I've tried to lead up to this, but you know, our basic insight is, you know, why should normal matter be the only type that's special? You know, it's really funny. You know, Copernican revolution was a while ago now, but every time we find out we're not the center of the universe, we get really upset about it. <laughs> and so, so in the case of dark matter, not only are we not the center of the universe, but we're not most of the matter of the universe. But then we're like, okay, yes, that's true but there's this other dark matter and it's really boring. It's just one type of particle. Yet, you know, we have 150 energy, but, or 160 energy, but, you know, we know of many different types of ordinary particles, all sorts of different masses, all sorts of interactions, there are electrons, there are quarks, muons, lots of different particles, lots of different forces. Yet we assume that dark matter is just some one single non-interacting particle, which, um, you know, might in some ways seem the simplest possibility, but it's also kind of an odd possibility because it's so different from the matter that we see. So it seems worth speculating that maybe uh, it's a little bit more like our stuff and that, you know, I, again, I sort of make some social analogies. I mean, we do the same thing where we, where we think about foreign cultures. We think of it in a very monolithic way. We think everyone's the same in other countries, but of course they have the same diversity that we have in our country, but we forget that a lot of the time. And the same way with matter, we, assume, we know our matter is really rich and has an interesting structure, but we assume dark matter is really simple. So maybe that's not the case. Okay. So in particular, uh, what we were interested in was the idea that there could be uh, self-interacting dark matter. Um, so, and it would have gravitational effects. We wouldn't see it directly because it's self-interacting. So just the same way that dark matter is invisible to us in the sense that it doesn't interact with our light, maybe dark matter has its own interactions that we literally don't see because, for the same reason. It's not interacting with us, okay? So in particular, we know that we can have ordinary electromagnetic radiation. Dark matter seems to be insensitive to it. Maybe dark matter has its own radiation, which you can amusingly call dark light if you like, um, but that doesn't interact with our stuff. And so that's the possibility, and the question is, would we know about it? Okay. Um, so we're going to assume that dark matter interacts, but only with itself, okay? Um, we also assume that this is not all of the matter. So we assume that most of the matter is this non-interacting stuff that forms the spherical halo, but there is this a component of the dark matter, it could be a small component, that, has, that interacts with its own light, okay? So we call this partially interacting dark matter, it's matter that interacts with its own force, um, but rather than assume it's all the dark matter, we assume it's only a fraction, like baryons. And again, you know, this is one of the things, you know, people are like, why would, you know, the, the first thought might be, why would I care about a fraction of the dark matter? I haven't even seen most of it. But by that logic, you'd say, why do I care about ordinary matter? After all, that's also only one-sixth the energy of all the matter, but, which is a small fraction. And the reason we care is precisely because it has all these interactions, which gives rise to the rich structure, which gives rise to the fact that we're all here today. And so maybe dark matter, whether it has a rich structure as, as ours, maybe it has some interactions. And if it does, maybe that would give rise to more readily visible consequences. Okay? So again, there's just some dark light. We just assume that dark matter, just like ordinary matter, can radiate and cool into the Milky Way. We assume that dark matter has a component that can do the same thing. And we call it dark matter, it's not interacting with our matter, but it still has its radiation, which could give rise to a dark matter disk, just like we have an ordinary Milky Way disk. Okay. So we call this a dissipative fraction, and I'm not gonna go through the slide. Okay. So, what would be the consequence? Well, it turns out that if the dark matter is heavier than, say, a proton, which is, you know, we often think is the case, that it would not only give rise to a dark matter disk, but that dark matter disk, you might expect it to be even narrower than the ordinary Milky Way disk. So there could be a disk that's even narrower. 
Um, so the idea is that even if it's really a small fraction of the dark matter, it's, if it really does dissipate, then there could be some region where the dark matter is very significant because it's so dense and it's concentrated into a very narrow region. Okay. So in that case, you might have a dark matter disk that's in the mid-plane of the Milky Way disk. Um, why are they aligned? Well, the gravitational forces would tend to align them. So, so we think that if there is a dark matter disk, it might well be aligned with the Milky Way, but be a small fraction in, in thickness. Okay, where am I pointing this? <laughs> Next slide. Oh, too many. Okay, all right, try again. There we go. Okay, and that gives rise to observable consequences um, because you've affected the gravitational potential of the Milky Way. And in particular, if you ask how stars move in the Milky Way, they don't just rotate, but they also move up and down through the Milky Way disk. Um, so if you have this dark matter disk, how they move up and down through the disk will be affected. So in principle, by measuring the positions and velocities of lots of stars in the Milky Way, you could establish what the potential is in the Milky Way, okay? And, and search for the existence of this dark matter disk. Now, um, most of you know that, you know, it took 50 years between the suggestion that there would be a Higgs boson before there actually was a discovery. In this case, you know, and we're particle physicists, we were, we were delighted to realize that there was actually a sat when we did this research, there was a satellite that was set to launch that very fall that we had done this research called the Gaia satellite. It's launched by the European Space Agency, whose sole purpose is to measure a billion stars in great detail in the Milky Way, probably about 1% of the stars in the Milky Way, to measure um, their position very precisely and their velocity very precisely. And so with that information, you have a chance to put a constraint or to detect a dark matter disk. And in fact, there had been older uh, data from Hipparchus satellite. And so we analyzed this. And more recently, people have been looking at the Gaia data uh, trying to put constraints. Um, for those of you who are actually astronomers, I can explain why there's some controversy, I would say, over the constraints they're putting having to do with whether the tracer stars are in equilibrium or not. But the fact is, this is the kind of data you want to use to be able to establish or uh, rule out, or at least constrain, uh, the existence of a dark matter disk. So it's real science. Whether or not you think it's right, this is what you do as a model builder. You propose a model, you say this is how you can look for it, and then you, um, there's observations that can go out and test it. Okay. And like I said, there is this bound from structure. I'm not gonna go into detail. Or I will go into detail, because they're not letting me change the slide. There we go, okay. All right, but the sort of catchy title of the book has to do with the fact that there could be other consequences conceivably if there is this dark matter disk. And again, I don't wanna cheat you, um, this is all very speculative, but the stuff about that I will tell you about the solar system and what happened, a lot of it is real and it's pretty amazing stuff, okay. So, um, you know, we all know about the solar system and we know that the number of planets has allegedly changed um, with, but what people sort of don't realize is that the demotion of Pluto was actually, in some sense, connected to some really great discoveries. Because what was being discovered were other objects that were sort of comparable, not, not that many, but you know, by being able to explore in the region of um, outside, you know, Neptune, there was actually, the, and in particular in the Kuiper Belt region, um, there actually were other objects that were found out there. So in fact, there's lots more to the Milky Way than just planets, um, whatever you want to call them. And in fact, there's all sorts of stuff that moves around. Um, so there's the asteroid belt, which has many, many objects. Um, there's the Kuiper belt, which actually not quite the Kuiper belt, but very near it is the scattered disk, which is a source of short period comets, comets with period less than 200 years. So those are things that when they come towards us, they're frozen objects out there, they're very far away. But when they come towards the sun, they then um, become, they emit these gaseous tails, which is how we sometimes see them, okay? But in addition to that, there's something called the Oort cloud, which is really thousands of times farther away from the sun than the Earth. So it's really far away, and there are many objects there, and it's more or less spherically distributed. And it's thought to be the source of long period comets, comets with periods greater than 200 years. But the thing to focus on is that this is really far away. 
And if it's really that far away, um, the gravitational binding energy of the sun is gonna be a lot smaller. Because as you know, the gravitational binding energy um, is proportional to one over distance squared. So if you have things that are thousands of times farther away, the gravitational force is really suppressed. Which means if there's any other source of small kick, it has the potential to kick the stuff out of the Milky Way or to come hurtling towards the Earth. You're more likely, it, um, if you kick it, that that would happen. Okay. And stuff really hits. It's kind of incredible. Um, on the surface of the Earth, I mean, we know there are craters on the moon. Well, there are actually craters from impacts on the Earth. Um, we see a lot fewer of them. Earth is uh, very geologically active. Um, but um, this is a very beautiful one that's in Arizona. Um, it's about a kilo kilometer big. Um, and it's probably one of the best preserved. And you know, these craters are a little bit confusing, or they were confusing to people at first, um, because it does sound kind of crazy to say stuff is hitting the Earth, even though we know it's true now. Um, and in fact, people didn't, people did, scientists didn't believe it at first, because after all, who actually saw stuff fall to the Earth? Well, there's people working out in the field. And so the scientific community was very dismissive of these people. You know, and you know, in fairness, they did have some crazy theories sometimes too. Um, but then eventually, uh, one of them fell right in front of the Scientific Academy in Siena, at which point they kind of had to admit that this was true. Um, so, but you know, but it's, even then, it's confusing though, because they're craters. Craters can also be from volcanoes. This one happens to be near a bunch of volcanoes, so you know, you have to establish exactly how they're formed. And there were a lot of theories, so it's a really interesting story, which I do tell in my book about you know, how people eventually were able to distinguish them and sort of the misguided ideas people had about how these things were formed. Um, but there's a lot of them, um, and so the ones I want to focus on are the ones that are big, um, and in particular ones that are bigger than a kilometer, and that were hit within like the last 250 million years. Um, why do I want to focus on the ones that are big? Well, I'm going to argue that the theory we have gives rise to the possibility that there were periodic impacts. Now, there are impacts all the time. Small asteroids and, you know, cosmic dust hits us all the time. Small asteroids hit. But these big objects that form big craters are, are more rare. But if you like, you can go to the internet and actually find the database of them. Um, and so it's pretty cool. Um, now, why would we give rise to periodic impacts? Well, suppose there is a dark matter disk. So suppose there is a dark matter disk. Suppose there's any disk. It turns out the solar system um, circulates in the, in the galaxy about every 240 million years. But as it does so, it bobs up and down a little bit, kind of like horses on a carousel. Now, it does that much more frequently than, it, than the entire uh, cir circuit. Um, and how often it does so is determined by how much matter is in the disk, because that's what's giving the gravitational restoring forces pulling it up and down. Um, now, the idea is that if you have the Oort cloud and you have these things that are very fragile, so that Every time you pass through this dark matter disk, which is very dense and narrow, every time you pass through, you have the possibility that there would be enhanced comet strikes because you're giving a little gravitational kick from a tidal force as it passes through. Um, and it turns out that if you put in the model of this disk, you actually match the data a bit better for it, rather than just have a random model. It turns out that it looks a little bit like this periodicity is true. It's way from ab being absolutely convincing I mean, after all, we only have about 25 of these things. The period turns out to be, the, the um, impacts seem to occur at an enhanced rate about every 30, 35 million years. So we don't have enough evidence to really establish it, but it remains a viable possibility that there's a dark matter disk, and it is actually giving a rise to an enhanced rate of these sort of big impacts coming from the Oort cloud. That's the idea, okay? Hmm? Bummer. <laughs> uh, if, it's, if it's true, though, I think it's really cool. Okay. So what is the connection to dinosaurs? So that's the one last step. Um, that's where we connected to life on Earth. It turns out that in the Phanerozoic eon, um, that roughly speaking, in the last 500 million years, there have been five major mass extinctions. And major mass extinctions are big. They're, you know, you have, you know, two-thirds of the species on, they're a little bit ill-defined, but, you know, two-thirds of the species on the planet get killed and leave no descendants. 
So those lines just get wiped out, okay? And this has happened about five times. Um, most notably, the Permian Triassic 250 million years ago uh, killed off about 90% of the stuff and notably was connected to high levels of carbon and other things that we see today. But the last one we know about is the one that happened 66 million years ago, which used to be known as the KT extinction, is now known as the KPG extinction, um, which was the one in which um, dinosaurs got killed. Not just dinosaurs, but two-thirds of the species on the planet. So in a sense, that is probably connected to our existence because dinosaurs were big, took up a lot of resources, they got wiped out. Mammals, which until that time were very small, maybe no bigger than a cat, uh, lived mostly underground, could finally come up to Earth and get big and eventually turn into us. Um, so it was a big deal. <laughs> but it's also, I mean, it is an incredible thing. I mean, you know, one, uh, one of the things I had fun looking into when I was writing this book was just, you know, a lot of this, the history behind it, because there really were these debates about slow evolution or fat, catastrophic occurrences. And of course, it's really a combination. So we think of evolution as a slow process, but there really are these times where we have this dramatic changes on, on, in life on Earth. And so that's why this possibility of a sixth extinction is, is, very, is really worth paying attention to, because we are actually killing off species at a much faster rate than we have in the past. Okay. Um, so that's basically, um, so basically, the end of the story, and I'm running out of time, so I will just tell you some of the rest of the story, um, is that there was a debate about, a, a big debate about what caused this last extinction. Um, you know, was it volcanic activity, um, et cetera. Um, what happened was um, actually uh, a geologist, but his father was a physicist, um, went and explored actually this layer. And the evidence for the extinction is very beautiful. It's actually, you see a white layer of rock where there were fossils, then there's a thin layer of clay, and then above it is a gray layer of rock because the stuff that was forming those fossils to give you the white rock disappeared. And it's found all over the globe. Um, and so you can look at, so basically to help establish what caused it, they had the idea that they wanted to measure uh, the thickness of this clay or measure something about the clay that could tell them how long it took for the extinction to happen. And so the idea that was proposed was to measure iridium which actually, um, on the surface of the Earth, um, you, you know a lot of the heavy elements, goes to the center of the Earth, so you don't have that much on the surface. So if you saw iridium, you could believe that there was sort of a cosmic hourglass that was coming from meteoric material descending onto Earth. But when they went and measured it, they found way more than they thought they should have, like 90 times more than they should have. And so this, the hypothesis was made that it was actually coming from a big impact. Now again, it's a, it's a great story. I wish I had time to tell you more about it, but those of you who are interested can read my book. Um, but it's available to be Even better. Um, so, it can, um, so basically, by looking around, t t so they knew how big, from the amount of um, iridium, they knew, and also from looking at the extinction, they knew when it had to have hit and how big it had to be. And it turned out none of the existing candidates um, were actually the right, right ones, they didn't, they didn't meet the, fit the bill. And so eventually, um, it turned out that it was um, a, a, a reporter um, who connected people who were geologists who had worked for Pemex, which was a Mexican oil company who had been doing geological surveillance to the scientists who were actually looking for the structure. And so he was the only one that knew bo about both of them and connected them and eventually it was found this big crater in Yucatan. Um, so I'll just show you a couple of photos of me uh, just looking at the layer, and it turns out this was in Spain, and one of the great things about looking at this layer is it's always in some place really beautiful. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of geological information there. So I'm just gonna have a couple of concluding slides just to say there are these amazing connections in the universe, and I don't have time to go into them all, but you know, a lot of us know that you know, st burning stars are where the heavy elements were formed. We now know about merging neutron stars as well, and, um, you know, large mammals emerged only after dinosaurs eliminated, so maybe there is a, another connection uh, to dark matter other than our very existence. Um, so I just want to take a brief pause to say, for me, you know, well, a lot of the time I'm focusing on the nuts and bolts when writing books, and, you know, just how we draw our conclusions, how we test things, but there really was this real sense of awe and wonder at all these amazing things that have happened to produce the, the world that we see today. 
One of the great things about this particular story is how it drew together so many different fields of science. It was chemistry, biology, geology, et cetera, physics. Another thing is just how recent our understanding is. Um, in the last 50 years, we've learned so much more, not just about particle physics, but cosmology and astronomy, but even about our, our very existence. And, um, but one thing you know, that ties back to what I said was one of my motivations was the importance of the rate of change. It's been important in scientific debates, and it's important in how things evolve, but it's also uh, you know, our, our change in knowledge. It's also uh, really ex escalating in many ways. So um, I don't know if this dark disk idea is right. I hope I've fairly presented it, but I do find it fascinating. And the search for it is ongoing as we speak. But I do know that there are amazing connections in the universe and ultimately to life. So I'm gonna just show one final slide, which um, is my joking argument of why you wanna have models, because you wanna know what to look for. And it has to do with the fact that I have friends who are writers on the Big Bang Theory, and I was visiting them and they said, you know, why don't you just sit in the cafeteria and be an extra? And I did, but it turns out like, like most people didn't notice. And even though if, if you look at it, I'm like right there. <laughs> so unless you knew to look, you wouldn't see it. And if I, you don't see something as obvious as that, you're not gonna see things without models. So with that, I'm looking through about dark moment dancers. Thank you. And book signing. And, and book signing. All of the books I believe are out there. Oh, great. Oh, nice. Thank you for that fascinating talk. Um, I have a very quick question. Since dark matter is uh, known to interact gravitationally, um, do the observations of, uh, of the ma mass of galaxy indicate any uh, consistency in the ratio of SM particles uh, to the dark matter? No, there's actually different types of galaxies. Um, it's a good, really good question. Um, and in some sense, um, it gives you an idea of where it might be better to look for. So maybe in our galaxy, it's probably about a factor of 100. But there are things called dwarf galaxies, which are small galaxies, which seem to be even more heavily dark matter dominated. So there isn't any fixed ratio. Although for similar size mass objects, there might be more consistency. But even then, that's not necessarily true. Um, I'm, I may be wrong, but um, I think you have... You can't wait. She just said women in science. You can't start by saying... <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm right, and... <laughs> I believe you have a theory, uh, not in this book, that says that... Um, I, I don't know the details, but that gravity, it may be... Um, since it's so weak, it may be coming from another dimension or multiverse or something like that. Um, given, that given that this dark matter only reacts with gravity, might it also be in this realm, whatever? So first of all, uh, my, uh, well, apparently all my books are out there, and actually I've done this work <laughs> about uh, weakness of gravity. It's not the origin of gravity, but it might explain why gravity is weaker, to have gravity concentrated elsewhere in an extra dimension. Um, but in answer to the question of is that connected to dark matter, um, there are ideas for how that can be connected to dark matter. Um, it could be you know, somewhere where you're not interacting with light. Um, the thing is, you know, it's going to be very hard to establish that. So what I would like to do is go through the more so-called obvious explanations first when you rule them out. I mean, so basically I worked on extra dimensions of space to explain the so-called hierarchy problem about the Higgs mass. But that was only after there were, re people have been working for decades trying to find a good solution and none of the existing solutions in the context of, you know, three plus one dimension of space seemed to be very, very convincing. So it was worth exploring this other possibility. Um, I can write down a model. It's very hard to know how to distinctly test it. So if there were really distinctive experimental consequences, it would be more worthwhile, but I don't know how to do that right now. So yes, it's a possibility. It has something to do with another dimension or extra dimensions in general, but it would be very hard to establish that at this point. One very key question. Uh, 
Uh, you mentioned that uh, two particles of dark matter can interact to form ordinary matter as a possibility. Is the reverse true, that ordinary matter might be able to interact to form dark matter? Yeah, and actually people put constraints at the Large Hadron Collider based on that possibility. Okay, that was easy to answer. <laughs> okay, one more question here. Go ahead. Last question. That's a good point. And so first of all, uh, physics isn't interested in anything because it doesn't have a consciousness. So it's only people who work on physics that are sometimes interested in that. And, then, <laughs> and, and, um, and you were totally right that it's really hard to establish. So I mean, I'd like to try to go, you know, take one speculation at a time. Here we had two speculations, and that's a bit of a leap. So, and, and I agree with you, it would be very hard to test at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Nils, for giving us this wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you very much.